Okay, now we've learned some integration techniques like U substitution. Um, we've learned how to use an integral to find the area between two curves. And uh, in this next chapter of our book, we're going to do a lot of applications now. Um, integrals can be used for more than just finding the area between two graphs. Um, so for the first section, we're going to talk about mostly finding volumes of solids. So uh, here's an interesting example. Imagine you had two quarter cylinders, a quarter of a cylinder, intersecting. Sometimes you kind of see this uh, on the corner of a ceiling. Um, the, the intersection of two quarter cylinders forms a little tent-shaped solid that I've drawn here and then blown up here. And so what we're going to do is find the volume of that solid. So what is the same about finding the volumes of solids, we're going to borrow that idea that just like with finding the area between two curves, we divide the area into a bunch of thin rectangles, and then we write a formula for the area of one of those rectangles, and the integral does the job of adding up the areas of an infinite number of rectangles. The, ideas, the idea for finding the volume of a solid is to imagine slicing it. If you think about slicing slices of this tent-shaped solid at different heights above the bottom of it, which is a square, every slice or cross-section at a height of x from the bottom are thin squares, square slabs with a little tiny thickness, which we'll call dx. Remember, dx in the context of rectangles when we were doing area represented the little thin width of those rectangles. So, for example, and it's helpful sometimes to get like a couple of different views of this. The overall solid looks like this. We're going to call the length of each side of one of my squares y. Let me bring this back up. The bottom square is a square with each side being three, but as you move up, the length of each side of the square will get smaller. So we're, that's gonna be a variable. So we're gonna call the length of each side y. Um, and so here's a blow up, here's one of our square slabs pulled out. The volume of our square slab is gonna be y times y times dx, length times width times height, y squared dx. Now, if we put a side view of this solid, if you were looking from the side, you would see this would be one of the edges of the square. And now here's where we're defining x to be the distance from the base to the top, from the bottom to the top. Okay. And knowing, looking ahead, that we're going to have to integrate and find the volumes of all of these square slabs throughout that region. What we want to now try to do is get this y in terms of x. So if we look at this picture here, let me slide this up a little further. Um, remember the radius of the quarter cylinders was three. If I draw a little auxiliary line from the corner to the edge here, that is a radius as well, so that has to be three. If x represents the distance from the bottom, then I can use the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals three squared, to find an, an expression for y squared. I don't even have to take the square root. I can replace that y squared with nine minus x squared. Now I have the volume of any one of those slabs, those square slabs, written as nine minus x squared times dx. And so if I want to find the total volume, the integral, if I integrate this volume formula from 0 to 3, from the bottom to the top, that will give me the total volume. And it's a pretty simple integration using your power rule, plugging in 3 and 0 gives us a volume of 18. 
Let's look at another volume question. Okay. So, if you take a half of a circle and we rotate it around the x-axis, it sweeps out a very familiar three-dimensional shape, a sphere. Okay, and so what we're really gonna be doing here is finding the volume formula for a sphere. Some of you may know that formula, but maybe don't know where it comes about. Um, it's not an easy formula to derive. In fact, the only way I know to find out the volume formula is to use an integral. So uh, if you've ever been curious about where the volume formula for a sphere came about, it's, this is gonna answer that question. So if I take the top half of a circle with a radius of A and the equation of that circle, x squared plus y squared equals a squared, if I solve it for y, I get the square root of a squared minus x squared. So that's this equation here. Now the idea, if you take one of those rectangles that we think about with area, if you rotate even just that rectangle around, what does it sweep out? And I have a little visual. So some of, the, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, you can get these at the party store. I'm gonna turn it sideways and then I'll... So right now it looks like a rectangle, but if I rotate it around its axis, and maybe I have to do it sideways, and sweep it all the way around, you generate a circular disc, right? This would be a decoration, a party decoration, but it starts as a rectangle, and then when you sweep it and rotate it around, it sweeps out a circular disc. So that's what you can envision. Let me zoom this back in. This thin rectangle, when I revolve it around the x-axis, sweeps out this disc, thin circular disc. And every rectangle in this circle would sweep out a disc like this. So in the same spirit as the previous problem, every cross section of this sphere is a thin circular disc. If we can find a formula for the volume of one of those thin circular discs, we can use an integral to add up all of the volumes to get our volume of a sphere. There we go. Okay. The volume of a thin circular disc, remember a thin circular disc is just like a cylinder. Most people know, know the formula for the volume of a cylinder is pi times the radius squared times the height, this being the height. And of course, the radius is the radius of the bottom. Well, you can think of this disc as just this cylinder squashed really thin and turned on its side. So the volume of the disc is pi r squared and what's standing in for the height, the height would be a little tiny thickness, in this case, of x. Right, this is the x-axis. The height would be dx. Okay. What we need is the radius then. The radius of this disk would be the distance from here to my original semicircle. That's my radius. And Therefore, my radius is the square root of a squared minus x squared. So I can substitute that in for r, square it. And now that I have my volume formula in terms of x, I can integrate it from negative a to positive a to find the volume. Or Okay, if you, if you know that the, there's symmetry involved here, right? The right half of the sphere has the same volume as the left half. And as you've probably become aware, it's really nice when one of your limits of integration is zero in terms of plugging in, right? That makes it easier. So you can either integrate from negative A to A or go from zero to A and just double your answer. 
here we go, right here, from zero to A. So I'm going to double that um, so I don't have to, so I get to plug in zero. Now, if you square the square root, that gets rid of it. Remember, you're integrating with respect to x. So the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. But a is a constant. That's the radius of our sphere. So the antiderivative of a squared is going to be a squared x. Right? When it's a constant, like 3. The antiderivative of 3 is 3x. Evaluate from a to 0. Do the math. And we come up with our very familiar formula, 4 thirds pi, in this case I had a as my radius, 4 thirds pi a cubed, which again should look familiar because that's the volume formula for a sphere. All right, let's look at another solid that's formed by revolving an area. A lot of the problems in this first section involve generating solids by taking an area and then spinning it around an axis. So let's say we take the area between y equals root x and y equals 1 fourth x, this little leaf, half of a leaf looking shape, and revolve it around the x axis to get a three dimensional solid. Okay. And we're going to imagine cross sections cutting through it vertically. This time, you don't get a solid disk here because this space was all empty, right? This was all empty space. So when we revolve it, this space is all empty. So if you cut through there, you're going to get, we call this a washer. If you've ever uh, screwed a screw into some wood, you want to have a washer to prevent the screw from going in too far here, right? So that, um, that shape we call a washer. And every slice through here is going to look like this shape. It's just the hole is going to get bigger in the middle, huh? It's going to just be different sizes. So how do I find the volume of this? Well, I would just take the volume of the outside disk and subtract out the inside. So it's pi r squared dx minus pi times little r squared dx. You can factor out the pi, and you can bring the dx out over here. I guess there's really parentheses there. So there's your general formula for the washer method. The big radius, this is why you want to draw the pictures. If they give, they usually they won't give you the picture, but so you want to draw the graph. The outside radius, big R, is the distance from the x-axis to the furthest function from the x-axis. So that would be your square root function. I'm putting that in for big R. And little r is the distance from the x-axis to the closest function to the x-axis, which is your 1 fourth x. And then you do want to add, add up all of these washers from 0 your last one would occur at x equals 16, which was the intersection of my two equations. Okay, here we're just going to do a setup. We're not going to work those out. Now, what if I took that same original region and revolved it around the y-axis? So I'm taking this little leaf that we started with. This was y equals root x. This was y equals 1 fourth x. They intersected at 16, 4. But I'm going to now spin it around the y-axis to get a shape that looks like this. It's like a cone with a curved inside, right? Now, to find the volume of this, to, to, to cut this thing to get shapes that all look the same, we want to slice it horizontally. So we're going to get horizontal washers. Right, this slice right here will pulled out will look like this. It's still a washer, which means the formula is going to be the same. Pi times the big integral of the big radius squared minus the little radius squared 
what changes, and this is a big deal, the thickness of any one of these washers, that distance right here, is now a small increment of y. So it's gonna be a dy integral. The implication is this. The big radius would be the distance now from the y-axis to the one that's furthest away. So back on my picture, that's actually gonna be to y equals 1 fourth x. But the other thing about dy, not only does it represent the thickness, it tells me when I integrate, I want to integrate with respect to y. So instead of writing y equals 1 fourth x, I have to write it as x equals 4y. That's the big radius. The little radius is the distance from here to y equals root x, also known as x equals y squared. The other thing that changes is I'm adding up these washers from what y value to what y value? Well, my lowest washer is right here at zero, and my highest one is at y equals four. So this upper limit is four. The most common rotation is taking a, a shape and rotating about either the x-axis or the y-axis, but we can rotate these things about any line. Let's say that same region, original region, I'm gonna now revolve around y equals negative one, which is a line one unit below the x-axis. So instead of rotating around the x-axis, I rotate around this line and I get a, a large, larger solid. Um, it's hollow, right? Vertical cross sections are still going to be washers, just like in, in the first example, part A. The only difference is when we were rotating around the x-axis, the radius was from here to here. We were increasing the radius by one unit, if you think about it, right? This distance right here is root x, but then I'm just adding one unit to that, right? I'm adding one unit to the radius. So my big radius now becomes root x plus one. I'm adding one to the radius and same thing for the small radius. It's one fourth x plus one squared. Um, we're back to integrating from zero to 16 because we're with respect to x. And then one last one with this shape. Let's say I take that original shape, y equals root x, y equals 1 fourth x, and the intersection point was 16, 4. And let's say I rotate this little leaf shape around the line x equals 16, this vertical line right here. So if you spin this around, you're going to get a shape that looks like this. Cross sections are still washers. If I slice through there, there's gonna be a hole. So my formula, general formula still applies where, where I'm gonna have volume is pi, big radius squared minus little radius squared. We're back to the thickness here is a small increment of y. So it is gonna be a dy integral. Now there's a little bit of trickiness here. You really wanna draw these pictures out carefully. Okay, the big radius of, the, of any one of these washers is the distance from x equals 16 to the one that's furthest away. So that would be our, our y equals root x, also known as x equals y squared. But any of these equations, all of your, your equations of graphs are always referenced from either the y-axis or the x-axis. So x equals y squared, which is just this solve for x, that's actually this distance. But our radius is this distance, right? That's the radius of this washer. Well, how do we do that? The total distance here is 16. If this is x equals y squared, then big R would be 16 minus y squared. Same thing for the inside radius. This Inside radius is right here. Um, the distance from here to this line would be x equals 4y. So we're going to go 16 minus 4y squared.
and you're going to add this up from zero to four, just like we did in part B. Yeah. The picture is really important to see that. Okay, one last one here. Um, there's a few of these in our book. Most of the problems, like I said, are, are revolving around an axis like the last example we did. Um, this one's more like the very first example, the tent problem, where it's not a solid that's formed by revolving something around an axis. Half the battle in, in these types of problems are just understanding what the shape they're trying to describe looks like. So we have the base of a solid lies in the xy plane bounded by y equals x squared and y equals one. Cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis, we're gonna start with them being squares. So here's what they mean by that. You have a three-dimensional solid. What I did was I, I uh, well, let's look at a top view first because they mentioned that the base of the solid land lied between y equals x squared and y equals one. So if you were to take a top view of this solid, your solid lies between these two graphs. But these are not just rectangles. These are meant to be rectangular slabs, okay? Uh, and they're squares, okay? They're supposed to be squares. So whatever this length is, this should have been the same height. So that doesn't look like a square, but they should have been the same. So imagine what I did here was I switched the axes just so we could see it. Here's your y equals x squared. Here's your y equals one. If I take this little thin vertical cross section, they mean you have a square coming up vertically from there, right? So it's a whole three-dimensional solid. And of course, the bigger the length of this line right here, you're going to get a bigger square, right? So you can picture this as a whole three-dimensional solid. Well, since every shape is the same, every shape is a thin square, if we can come up with a formula for the volume of one of these, the integral can add them all up. This length right here we know is top minus bottom, one minus x squared. Because they told us it was a square, that means this height is also one minus x squared, and then the thickness of it is dx. So the volume of any one of those square slabs or cross sections is one minus x squared times itself, so one minus x squared squared, times dx, the total volume of this solid, I would integrate this from negative one to one. That was, that's where these two graphs intersect. So there's my total volume. Now there's twists on this problem. Here, this would be the formula for the volume if my cross sections were squares. What if we said the cross sections were semicircles. So in other words, those same vertical cross sections here, you have a semicircle here that's, so I guess this length right here, the one minus x squared is actually the diameter of those semicircles. What's the volume of a half of a circle cross section? It would be one half pi r squared, I would add here times dx, right, times the thickness of that times dx. We should have. So my radius, this distance we saw was one minus x squared. The radius would just be half of that, right? Half of one minus x squared squared dx times one half pi because we're doing a half of a circle. And for my total volume, I can pull out the one half pi integrate this once again from negative one to one, and that gives me the total volume. So the theme here, the idea, right, is that if you have a three-dimensional solid and you can imagine slicing it in such a way that every shape, every slice is the same shape, if you can come up with a formula for the volume of any one of those shapes in terms of x or y or some other variable, the integral can add up all of those semicircles to give you the total volume. That's the big concept, and we'll practice more of that going forward.